Zoning code ordinance review. Commissioner Westman? Here. Commissioner Ortiz? Here. Commissioner Newman? Here. Chairperson Welch? Here. And Commissioner Smith is absent tonight. So we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. With liberty and justice. Okay, well, welcome to our ongoing saga of uh, getting through the zoning code update. Uh, just a little announcement first this meeting is being cable cast live on Charter Communications, Cable TV Channel 8, and ATT UVerse Channel 99, and is being recorded to be replayed on the following Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Meetings can also be viewed from the city's website at www.cityofcapitola.org. Our technician tonight is Scott Gray, and if you could just turn off your uh, cell phones to vibrate um, during our meeting, and if you do choose to come up and uh, speak, Marilyn, you can uh, just give us, uh, we know your name, um, just sign the sheet, since that's our only person in the audience. Okay, we'll start off uh, with any oral communications, any additions or deletions to? Uh... Staff has no changes, but I would note that we distributed a revised agenda to correct the Coastal uh, Commission information in the initially published agenda. Okay. Um, he had an oral communication. Oh, okay. <coughs> she may. Is, this, is she ready for the Marin, hearing? Marilyn, are you, are, you, are you gonna do this for the hearing? Is this on the wireless part? or? This is on smart meters. I don't think that's on the agenda. Okay. I have friends who live in Capitola Shores, and in, uh, I think it was March or May of 2015, these so-called smart meters exploded off the walls. A friend who lives there was quite traumatized because she's lived through a fire before and her surge protectors were smoldering. Her neighbor's equipment, um, the washing machine was ruined because of the power surge. Now throughout, uh, this isn't unusual, there's been fires and explosions resulting in fatalities. Fortunately, no one here died from the explosion and serious injuries, and this prompted, after these fire incidents, some places are listed in parts of Saskatchewan, Oregon, et cetera, recalled these meters. We know how drugs are recalled because they're dangerous, and um, there are other problems with these uh, meters in terms of uh, health impacts, there's surveillance meters and in, in um, violator privacy rights or right to health. And I also know people who've had to move because of these meters who tried to shield their place from the pulsing radiation, people who sleep in another room. And I think you all received the documentary a couple of years back called Take Back Your Power where there was a lot of testimony. So I believe we are all responsible, um, uh, officials like yourself, citizens, to protect the public health and well-being and remove uh, something that harms us and actually promotes fires. So I'd like to see you and the city council look into what these other localities have done to replace these meters with the analog mechanical meters that don't have 
these same kind of problems. This is a very informative uh, brochure, so I'll pass these out, and I'd like to see these things removed because they're, they're definitely a hazard. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Okay, uh, since we're on to public comments, anyone else that would like to? And this is for things that are not on tonight's agenda. So tonight we're going to be talking about wireless uh, communications. <coughs> My name is Patricia York, and I didn't come prepared here to speak this evening, but someone had to me something to read. So um, it's, um, it, uh, it's um, Olga Stone, uh, the Olga Stone, uh, I don't know exactly what it is. I, ju I was just handed this. So it's, uh, Dear Ms. Buttes, I am writing to tell you of the negative health effects our family and pets have suffered after living at our residence at 3054 Elva Lane in Live Oak from 1988 to 2002, which just happens to be very close to the cell tower with multiple carriers on it located at Capitola Road and Clare Street, which was erected after we had lived there for a few years. We looked out our door and there it was. I was not happy, but the worst was yet to come. After a seizure, on 4-4-2006, uh, I was diagnosed with a, 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 G, a glioblastoma brain tumor, an aggressive kind of a brain tumor, and told that I had about nine months to live. I'm still here, but never know for how long. In 2006, I had two brain surgeries, radiation and chemotherapy. This year, it looks like I will have another brain surgery in July. They already tried more chemo, but regrowth continued. My husband and I have had chronic um, bad migraines. I have also, um, I also had chronic insomnia. I had tendonitis while living near the cell tower, and my husband had suffered from Crohn's disease. Both our dog and our cat died of cancer in 2004 as well. Do we want the health effects of cell towers to proliferate in our community? It feels like an invasion. Sincerely, Olga Stone. And this was in the Sentinel, A12 Sentinel uh, 318. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, since I don't see any more members in the audience, I would uh, go ahead and close the public comment period. And uh, <laughs> everyone, uh, oral communication. Okay. Yeah. It, it's uh, come to my attention that one of our sister... Uh, Cities, Palo Alto ha is working on an affordable housing ordinance for uh, citizens with incomes between 150,000 and 250,000 a year. <laughs> <laughs> so, just something to put on our task list. Yeah, I'll do it. We'll add it into the zoning code. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's true. Serious. The staff you, support program. <laughs> yeah. Any other commissioner comments? No. Okay, then I guess we'll uh, move into approval of our meetings from our special meeting of October 6th. And do we have a motion? I'll, to, I'll so make a motion. Go ahead. Yeah. Second. Okay. Commissioner Westman and Ortiz. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And that passes. Okay, so this, pro this, this portion will be um, uh, the public hearing for the wireless telecommunication ordinance update as part of our zoning code update. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, by way of background, to give you some context for tonight's item, the wireless chapter is part of our zoning code update. However, the schedules don't appear to be aligned anymore, so we're going to process the wireless ordinance uh, individually. Um, as you recall, we did uh, the city did agree to a settlement agreement with Verizon that came out of a federal lawsuit that they filed last year challenging the city's denial of the cellular facility at the subway on 41st Avenue. Uh, under that agreement, we uh, are obligated to have the City Council adopt an ordinance locally by the end of February. So we're proceeding, as I said, on a separate track with the wireless ordinance. So tonight we'll introduce the ordinance, um, open public testimony, ask for any direction that the Planning Commission may have in terms of revisions to the ordinance, and then we're going to ask you to continue the item until the meeting on December 1st. The reason for that is we do have some administrative cleanups we need to do. Um, as you recall, things like minor use permits were in the draft zoning code update, but there is no minor use permit uh, in our current zoning code, and we propose to use that permitting tool um, for wireless facilities. So some of those procedures we're going to have to move into the wireless ordinance until such time the zoning code update is ready to go. 
Just a quick summary of the revisions that are before you tonight. Um, we have updated the ordinance to comply with existing state and federal law. Uh, we've established four tiers of permit review, which I'll go over shortly. Uh, we established preferred sites and locations for wireless facilities. Uh, we've added a requirement that concealment or stealth facilities be provided wherever feasible. Um, this ordinance update would apply our standard public notice procedures to wireless facilities. And we've also included a height exception allowance into this draft ordinance. Some of the changes we've made to comply with state and federal laws, we've re revised our definitions to mirror those found in federal law and FCC regulations. We've also eliminated the coastal and residential setback requirements that were the, the cause of the litigation we had uh, this past year with Verizon. Uh, as you recall, the current code requires a 3,000 foot setback from the coast, 500 feet from nearly all residential uses and parks and public facilities, and then an additional 500 foot setback in parks, schools, and nursing homes. Um, the lawsuit that uh, Verizon filed alleged that those setback requirements effectively prohibited facilities in the vast majority of the city, so we've eliminated those. We've also increased the length of an approval from five to 10 years to be consistent with federal law. And we've added a new ministerial process for section 6409 permits, which I'll describe in the uh, forthcoming slides. So section 6409 permit is aptly named after 60, section 6409 of the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act and subsequent FCC orders, which are aimed to accelerate wireless facility permitting. Uh, these types of permits apply to modifications to existing facilities, co-locations, and removal and replacement of wireless facilities. Uh, under Section 6409, uh, the city may not deny and shall approve those applications unless it involves a substantial change, being the key operative word there. So what's a substantial change? Well, I'm not going to go into all the detail here, but we can certainly come back if you're interested. But it basically relates to the height of a facility, the width, whether there's new equipment that wasn't previously on a site, uh, excavating uh, beyond the site limits, and uh, anything that would remove an existing concealment feature. One of the big parts of the Section 6409 uh, permits is that it imposes a shot clock on local agencies which requires us complete processing of applications within 60 days of submittal. Um, the shot clock begins when the applicant drops off their application and is only suspended once we get an incomplete letter to them and they're uh, gathering up the information and data to resubmit. Uh, if the city were to fail to comply to those time limits, it could lead to an automatic approval. And, and the real effect of it is that it effectively precludes publicly notice hearings and any appeal procedures. The timelines just don't allow um, public hearings or appeals. Some of the remedies that we have tried to put into the ordinance to address that is having a front-loaded process where applications are not accepted until all the information is provided. Uh, we've tried to make this a, a ministerial, uh, easy permit process. And then there's always the availability of tolling agreements with the carrier if you hit a roadblock and you need more time. And generally, uh, carriers are agreeable to minor tolling agreements. So the four tiers of permit review that we're proposing, the first one would be for the 6409 permits. Uh, it's distinct from all the rest of them because of the shot clock requirements. Um, these would be staff issued permits. There would be no mailed public notices, although the sites would be posted and they would not be appealable. A tier two permit would be administrative permits, again, issued by staff, no mailed public notices. Uh, sites would be posted, but these would be appealable to the Planning Commission. Third tier would be a minor use permit, uh, staff issued. Public notices would be mailed to homeowners within 100 feet uh, who could request a hearing uh, before the Planning Commission without appealing it, and the Planning Commission decision ultimately could be appealed on those as well. And then finally, the standard conditional use permit process that we're all very familiar with today. So th this table is kind of a truncated version of the one that's in your staff report and in the wireless ordinance that refers to various types of facilities and their tiers. Again, this tier one uh, permit would be um, a 6409 permit. Uh, tier twos would generally be building and facade mounted facilities which are completely concealed and comply with all city height and noise regulations. And pole mounted facilities in the right of way which are not concealed or do not extend more than two feet horizontally and five feet vertically from a pole. And these, to qualify for a tier two, would have to be located in a commercial or industrial zone. 
Tier 3, this is the minor use permit process, would involve building and facade mounted facilities that do not qualify for a Tier 2 permit, um, and pole mounted facilities in right of way that do not qualify with height limitations. These would also have to be in commercial districts, uh, mixed use districts, open space, and other non residential zoning districts. And then finally, the conditional use permit process would be Tier 4. These are new towers in any zoning district, any facilities in a residential zoning district, or any facility which doesn't qualify for one of the preceding permit tiers. The preferred sites and locations that we've established, uh, preferred sites, we've, this is the order in which they're listed in the ordinance. Uh, would, the first preferred site would be a city-owned parcel. The reason for that is the city has additional control beyond its discretionary authority. Um, if we are also the property owner, we can negotiate the terms of the lease and the design of a facility beyond what the ordinance may ordinarily allow. Uh, following that are co-locations within the right-of-way. These would be things like utility poles most commonly. Co-locations outside of the right-of-way. New base stations in the right-of-way. Base stations, um, for your information, is a term we didn't really like, but it's found in federal law, so we kept it. And it generally refers to any type of wireless facility that's not a tower. So something that's put on a facade of a building, that'd be considered a base station. Uh, next would be base stations outside the right-of-way, and then towers in and out of the right-of-way being the least preferred sites by the ordinance. One question we would have for the Planning Commission is if you have a preference between a right-of-way location and a non-right-of-way location. Staff didn't feel particularly strongly about this. However, we did uh, decide ultimately to give the right-of-way locations preference because they're typically utility poles, and it's already kind of a, a visually cluttered environment oftentimes. They blend in with the other poles. You want to keep going and then questions yeah. at the end? Can I sure. Uh, either way. Yeah, I brought this up, I think, last week. But the, the issue of co-location concerns me from the standpoint of undergrounding. Which is something that I hope to see more of as the time goes by in Capitola. Sure. And if you co-locate in a, a area that's going to be undergrounded, then you might not have chosen the second you know, best one. That's a good point. I think we could maybe work something into the ordinance that um, specifies that if it's an area targeted for an undergrounding project, that those we wouldn't be a preferred that. site, yeah, right? Some, some reference to that at least. That's a good point. That's a good one. So preferred locations uh, are non-residential zones in the or ordinance in the order of industrial zones, commercial zones, and any other non-residential zones like public facility, parks and open spaces, visitor serving. In terms of residential zones, we did break it up further. If a facility had to go into a residential zone, we would prefer that it be uh, on a residentially zoned site that does not have residential uses. Uh, followed by parcels that have approved non-residential uses and residential uses. And then finally, if all other alternatives fail, a uh, residential site could be considered. I mentioned the concealment was a requirement, um, if at all feasible, in the draft code. Just to go through quickly, a utility poll, what we'd be looking for is something representative of the image on the left, as opposed to that on the right that's much more visually obtrusive. Facade mounted facilities, again, trying to conceal it. You know, good example is the one on the left. We really can't tell there's any facility there, whereas the one on the right, the antenna are clearly visible. Towers come in a lot of different varieties, and it's kind of subject to the eye of the beholder. You have faux flagpoles. You have some faux trees that look pretty good if they're set, uh, set within the right context and designed well. Um, the other two on the right, the faux tree, you know, it really doesn't hide anything. And then naked monopoles, that's... One facility where I, I, you know, I don't know how you really effectively conceal that. I think that's something that somebody comes in with a big monopole, it just is what it is. We've made changes to public noticing. As you recall, our current code has expanded noticing requirements that exceed any other type of development in the city. Uh, it requires a 600-foot notice be sent um, for any CUPs or design permits for wireless facilities, and also requires us place an ad in the newspaper for an administrative permit. Again, unlike anything else, uh, any other project types in the city. The draft code would standardize the noticing to the typical 300 feet for CUPs, 100 feet for minor use permits, and we would not have an ad for administrative permits. The current code also doesn't allow any uh, height exceptions, and this has been problematic because it leaves us to process variances for over height 
cellular facilities, and variance findings, as you're aware, are very difficult to make in those cases. So what we've done is incorporate an eight-foot height exception allowance for any facility if it's mounted on a rooftop in an existing building, if it's completely concealed, and if it's architecturally integrated into the building. Uh, moreover, the code would allow an unlimited height exception for towers and utility poles if the Planning Commission found that the height is required to meet coverage objectives, there's no alternative sites or facilities feasible, and it complies with the code's design standards. So that concludes my presentation. Staff's uh, recommendation this evening is to accept the presentation, open public testimony for comments, and provide us with any direction on revisions you'd like, and then continue the public hearing until December, and we'll return um, with a code that incorporates any revisions we hear from you tonight and uh, some of the administrative business we need to um, put into the wireless chapter. Thank you. Okay, I, I, administratively, I just have a question. So we'll, we'll do our public comment period tonight, and then we'll close that, and then we'll continue our discussion on this, but do the public comment period will be closed other than that session at, outside of that uh, public comment previous? Yeah, if you accept public comment tonight, I mean, it would be at the chair's discretion whether or not we open it again at the next meeting, but you certainly wouldn't be required to do so. Okay. And uh, any questions of the staff before we... Okay, so we're going to go ahead and open this up for public comment tonight. We're going to have the three-minute timer on, and uh, any of those in the audience that would like to uh, address the Planning Commission on this issue, we'll give you three minutes to come and uh, speak to us. We really need to stop the corporate power stranglehold over democracy in this instance on the part of Verizon. So this is, you know, as a public school teacher for 30 years, we always try to not have bullying where kids threatened other kids. But this is very clear that if Verizon is dictating and putting their toxic radiation emitting sites everywhere without consent, informed consent by anyone for this 24-7 involuntary microwave radiation trespass that violates our right to health, privacy, constitutional rights. Um, we have nothing here. Uh, you don't have your rights to health. We don't have anything. The words that Verizon uses often, they're deploying things. This is stealth technology. This is military. And Barry Trower, I'm going to give you some literature again, worked in the British Secret Service. I quoted him before in the 60s and 70s, and his specialty was microwave radiation weaponry. And he states, these are the same frequencies and power densities that used in the military to harm people, destroy weapons, as it's used in this wireless technology. And they, he states that with 30 different pulsed frequencies, they could affect about 50 different aberrations in physical and mental functioning through entrainment. And we know statistically around the world, surveys of cell tower uh, nearby residences show that people are, there's increased cancer, people experience fatigue, headache, cardiovascular problem, memory loss. We know there's DNA strand break. Um, so by approving this, what you're actually doing is harming people knowingly because you're just following Verizon's corporate orders. And under the state zoning codes, and this basically wipes out any zoning code requirement, you're supposed to protect the public health and well-being. And what is going on here is pretty terrifying. I want to end with a question. As I recall, each of you received a copy 
and this is what this is about, of the FCC's press intimidation, suppression of science, and the push to roll out 5G technology, the head of the FCC, and there's some health professionals on here. My question is, did each of you receive one of these? I think it was a couple of months ago, or at least a month ago, and did you view it? And I'd like a response, just yes or no, because I consider this a critical part of your homework and understanding of the implications, scientific implications of this technology. Well, thanks, Marilyn. I'm not going to ask the other commissioners to. I can tell you I didn't review that, but having said that doesn't mean that I didn't do, do my homework before I came here. So okay. I, I appreciate that. And, and, and your time that. is up, Marilyn. Th so okay, thank you. thank you. Did anybody else view it? It's really critical. Thank you for acknowledging that. Okay, thank you, Marilyn. Is there anybody else who would like to get up and speak tonight? Thank you. I would just like to say that, um, once again, I didn't come prepared to speak this evening, but I would like to concur with everything that Marilyn said. I'm, I also am a victim of injuries from living near a cell tower within a, about a block of a cell tower, and I suffer greatly from living near that cell tower. I have insomnia, and I have become very ill since living near that cell tower. And the woman I just uh, read about uh, in this letter that was handed to me, uh, she actually did die in uh, last winter, so from the cancers and the tumors and such that have happened to her from the cell towers. So they, they are harmful and they are injurious to our health. They make us very, very ill. So thank you for supporting us and doing what you can. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Jim Hurd from the law firm McKenzie and Albritton, representing Verizon Wireless. I'd first like to thank the uh, city attorney and your staff and this commission for uh, working with us to improve this ordinance. We've made some comments on previous drafts. We've seen some improvements in response to those. We appreciate that. Uh, there is still some work to be done. As we noted in the letter we uh, sent to you a couple of days ago, my colleague Paul Albritton sent you a letter on November 2nd. And I'd just like to touch on those briefly. Uh, the current draft still has uh, some level of city regulation of ongoing uh, RF emissions compliance and some level of city regulation of RF interference. And as we set forth in the letter, those issues are preempted by the FCC. Certainly uh, requiring demonstration of compliance at the outset is reasonable and we have no issue with that, but there's simply no reason to require compliance, uh, demonstration of compliance on an ongoing basis where there's been no change to the facility because uh, it's just simple physics. These um, certifications are done on worst case assumptions including maximum power levels. So if there's been no change in the equipment, there's no change in the RF emissions. So it's simply expensive, busy work, and it's also preempted by the FCC, which has seen no reason to impose these sorts of ongoing, re repetitive compliance demonstrations. Um, the next issue is requiring re-permitting of facilities that were originally approved under Section 6409, if Section 6409 were ever to go away. Uh, this is probably not something that's critical at this point, but if, if it were to go away, those facilities have nonetheless been approved under law that was in effect at the time and under standard California land use law, our client has vested rights where it's built those facilities in reliance on a, a valid a permit that was valid at the time. So we would request that you eliminate the requirement to re-permit those facilities. Uh, and then finally, the preference for city property, we understand the reason for that, uh, but we would request that it be modified to apply only where uh, it's technically feasible from a coverage <coughs> perspective and it's on reasonable terms and conditions. Um, the, the concern is if the city were effectively making itself the only game in town, uh, those sites could become very costly or they could come with other conditions 
that uh, we don't normally see in the private market. So we would request those two modifications. And then finally, I'd just like to say that we're not talking about weapons. We're not talking about a, a menace. This is a technology that is, in fact, uh, vital to public safety. Most 911 calls are made from cell phones these days. Most emergency responders rely on this technology. We very often see them come out at these hearings where there's an individual site up for review and speak in favor of approval because they don't have reliable service in certain parts of the community and they really need that to do their jobs. So I would ask you to consider that. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I will just conclude by thanking you again for working with us on this ordinance. Okay, Mr. Sir, I think we have one question for you. Do you happen to know the section about uh, having to recheck the facility periodically? I wanted to look at the language of that. Uh, you're you're talking about the FCC emissions compliance? The first point you made, you said that you didn't want. Uh, that is section 17.104.050, sub capital A, sub number 8. A8? Yes, sir. FCC compliance? Yes. Your, your contention is that that's, uh, that's not consistent with the federal law. I, again, it's the it's the ongoing nature of the of of the provision that that we have an issue with. Uh, demonstrating compliance initially is not. We don't, something we object to for sure that somebody hadn't done some modifications or well that's why we proposed a compromise that would require recertification whenever any modification is is proposed but I mean how, do, how does the city know yeah. whether there has been some change well you require a permit for any change and we Certainly, don't tell our clients to go out and change their facilities without permits. That's all I can. That's all I can tell you. If they're if they're doing it, they're not doing it with our advice. Any other Any questions? questions? And we do have our legal representation here tonight too. So if we have questions, we can ask our thank you legal side. Thank you. So this isn't always a fun one because it's uh, it's a trouble. I think well, I think we pretty much. Did you want to speak tonight? Okay. Oh, okay. You're just early. Okay, thank you. Get a good seat. Yeah. So I'll bring it back to the commission to uh, have the discussion. So I think. Uh, Commissioner Newman's point was a valid one, and it seems like if they're going to take away the ongoing monitoring on the basis that the facility can't change, perhaps there ought to be included some sort of consequences if, and I don't I have any idea what they could be if the facility was changed without getting permits, or do we just rely on our regular procedure for somebody who does something without a permit. Sort of like uh, there's a rule that you can't live in a garage. Right. So I will assume there nobody does in Capitol. Right. 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 Yeah, we, we would be using our uh, standard process for their, if somebody did a modification without obtaining the appropriate permit, they'd be in violation of the code and you'd have an enforcement action for violation. Which isn't a whole lot. I would also point out, uh, City Attorney and I have <coughs> looked at the um, information provided by Verizon, looked at the code, and there might be some compromise solutions uh, other than what the speaker presented where we could still require some kind of verification that they're in compliance with FCC, but um, it might be something that's more acceptable to Verizon. So we'll discuss that more with them between now yeah. and December. Right, because the, the, the local manual um, that the FCC puts out, um, it does recognize that state and local go governments will have an interest in verifying compliance um, and that uh, 
So, but what it focuses on is if there are compliance questions to reach out to the provider to determine whether or not they're in compliance. And so that's part of what we're trying to achieve with this um, provision is one in indicating that they'll, they'll be in compliance with FCC um, standards and requirements and two that there'll be some, we'll be able to obtain evidence of current compliance. Well, all in all, this seems like a really well done uh, job to mm -hmm. comply with the whatever obligation you had under the settlement agreement to get an ordinance moving. And I, but I do think we should keep that one provision that I had to point to about uh, com verification. I, I'm, I'm not, and, and this is partly in response to the public's concerns too uh, of the issues surrounding these kinds of facilities. That uh, just to once it's up and then to have no ability, I, I just can't imagine that the federal law would uh, invalidate that provision. So I think it should stay the way it is. And, and one option um, that we were looking at recommending is a, um, possibly an affirmation from the um, provider that they are in compliance with FCC that's requirements the, under uh, penalty of perjury. How does it go to the hand, the uh, keeper, the chicken? No, the fox. The fox. Keeper, yeah. The chicken. The fox. Yeah. 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 Fox, anything else? I like it just the way it is. <laughs> <coughs> does it do anything else? I have some questions about um, reference to, you know, public right of way and as opposed to private. I'm wondering what our terminology and, and uh, what is the word? Is it is it is it preference that we used for that? I'm, I'm trying to preference. Yes, right. there's kind of uh, so. What does that mean in this instance? Does that mean that uh, we are going to ask them to do that? Always apply within the right of way unless there's some. Uh, they can show some cause why they cannot do that. Is that what? That's a good question. Uh, you know, so one of the standard procedures we have today and that we're going to continue is that applicants submit an alternative sites analysis, which shows us why the site they selected complies with the code um, and why no other more preferred sites may be feasible. So if they came in, say, with a, a large tower on a single family lot, our initial reaction would be, well, if you looked at sites within the right of way or sites within an industrial or commercial zone, they may, you know, be a little further away from residential areas. And if they could provide evidence that they couldn't meet coverage objectives, we'd be obligated to approve it. Um, if they failed to provide that, though, then the onus would be on them to find a more compliant site. So the way that we've written this ordinance now is considered by our attorneys to be in line with the federal law? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. not, it's not um, the, well, part of uh, the issue that was raised um, in Verizon's comment letter is also looking at state law, so it's there's a spider web of, of federal and state laws that regulate this area, and um, one of the um, California laws is that uh, local agencies um, essentially can't mandate a particular location or particular properties, and uh, so uh, Verizon's concern was that this could be the our language with the pre preferences could be inconsistent, and. Um, I, I don't. I don't think that they are consistent at, are inconsistent as written. I think that um, because they have a preference and not a requirement, that um, it is in line with both state and federal law in this arena. Yeah, it seems to me that you're giving them some options. Still, it's not mandating where they have to put it. But um, my concern is schools and parks and open spaces, and I don't know how how do I, they obviously have some very good lobbyists. It ties our hands because I don't disagree with Maryland that we have a responsibility to protect the interests of uh, the citizens of Capitola, but our hands are tied in, in a lot of these circumstances. But those areas that we do have some control, I think we ought to keep that control and we ought to, we ought to exercise it. And uh, having been in the public safety uh, um, area for most of all 32 plus years, um, I understand the need of, I, I spent my whole life around RF, obviously, uh, in that process, but I would be willing to forsake it in some areas, and we obviously, we do. And it's, interestingly enough, it seems like those areas that we do need is where we don't have it, but um, how do we how do we allow this in schools and open areas? It seems to me we ought to have some latitude to have some spaces that are free of that type of technology there. Uh, not that you don't have the override, but not having a, a site 
on those facilities. So I'll ask the city attorney to correct me if I'm incorrect, um, but I don't believe we could ex exclude any of those areas um, based on FCC and state regulations. I think you have to at least make that available should they demonstrate that no other feasible alternative sites are available. Um, and also in terms of school sites, the city doesn't have any land use authority. Um, you know, they issue their own permits through the state. state and, right? yeah, yeah. So we wouldn't have any say in those. But, uh, you know, an obvious one would be uh, at the New Brighton Middle School where we have a park area, the city owned next to it. It seems to me those are areas that we'd want to protect of, uh, of you know, having facilities of that type there. Now, one thing we could do if it's the commission's concern is we could reorder it somewhat and push um, open space areas and parks into the tier four category of facilities proposed there. I would need a conditional use permit. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's the very least we could do. Uh, as have that as a recommendation, but I'll leave that to my fellow commissioners. Is that something so it sounds like? You know, one thing does occur to me is if it's on a public park, city council would have to approve a lease, so it would go to the council anyway. So, it, you know, we could easily put a planning commission approval there. It's kind of a logical process to get to the council anyway. Well, and it seems if we have this list of uh, priorities of areas for um, these sites to be used, preferred sites, that um, within a given area, there's got to be a better uh, opportunity to put a tower in or uh, that type of facility other than a, a city park. I mean, it seems to me we could find something within a given area. We're only 1.7 square miles. Um, I'm sure we could find some other property to be more conducive to it than a park or a yeah, so I, I think um, Rich is correct that the uh, the way to address that is one in the the tiers of the permits and pushing that into the tier four, and then also in looking at the preferences listed and putting that those areas in the the lowest category of preferences for sites. And my other concern was really with the noticing. I know I, I realize that uh, with the noticing we were changing that. So uh, right now it's at 600 feet um, noticing. And we're going to change that to the normal 300 feet, and then, and I realize we don't get a lot of, um, we don't have a lot of leeway when these, based on state mandates and federal mandates. So, um, but I think if nothing else, it brings some awareness to the people in those neighborhoods that it, um, you know, that that's going to take place. And uh, um, if there's nothing else, we can make people aware of the, of that process. But. That's just me. I don't know if you guys really care. Well, it just brings up again the uh, how antiquated the newspaper uh, ad. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. But I guess we're stuck with that. Well, I don't. I don't see why we couldn't get, you know, uh, eliminate the newspaper ads and keep the 600 feet. It's, it's a CUP. I, the state requires it. Yeah. The site. state requires us when we do a conditional use permit to do the newspaper ad. I think the noticing radius is certainly within the Planning Commission Council's discretion to set that. Staff's thinking there was, you know, 300 feet is the standard for everything else, even large projects which are highly controversial. And my guess is that when that 600 feet uh, standard was put in there was largely based on RF concerns. Sure, absolutely. And we're tailoring this code to now really look at the design and not consider those RF concerns. And that was some of the rationale to using a standard noticing. Nonetheless, we could still easily do that. Well, to me, I, I understand there, it, the noticing isn't going to change the outcome of what's going to happen there other than it just brings an awareness to that the neighborhood. That's That would be the only reason, really. Yeah. I mean, this, this is such a frustrating process because there's so little that we can do. And, um, you know, you don't want to create the expectation, but that people have this expectation that they can come here and we can do things that, um, you know, legally we can't do because we do have to follow state and federal law. It's sort of a, you know, we say this every time, it's the state and federal laws that need to be changed, um, not so, you know, if we're going to really address this issue. Very true. 
Well, are there any more questions? Uh, and what about Commissioner Newman's other comment about the undergrounding of the utilities? Will something be put in there? Uh, to I thought it was a great comment, something yeah. candidly we didn't think of, but uh, I think we'll work that in and show you the change uh, in December. Yeah, we actually just had that come up, I think, on one of the Verizon on, um, on a wharf. A wharf Road, right, where that pole was yeah. going to be basically only there for a – so that's a, that's a good comment. Well, so if, oh, we, go ahead. If, we just continue this? Oh, yeah, I was going to say, if there's nothing else, then we'll continue um, this I'm, discussion. I'm not clear on what the guidance was for the noticing for you. I think it's to Maybe retain the 600-foot standard but eliminate the newspaper ad for administrative permits. That's what I heard. Mm -hmm. And to move the uh, – Schools and open space parks to uh, tier four. We'll move those to tier four. Move them down the ladder and the ranking of preferred sites and locations. And we'll also address the undergrounding. Okay. Then, if that's it, I'll ask for a motion to continue this to our next December, meeting, Des December first. December first. I'll make a motion to continue this hearing to December first. Second. Second. Not to second. Thank you. Commissioner Newman, second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thanks, so, <laughs> so if there's nothing, nothing else, we'll uh, just take a break until our 7 o'clock meeting. from a special meeting so we've already done our roll call and pledge of allegiance so at this point we'll go into oral communications and uh, we'll start off with any additions or deletions to the agenda uh, thank you mr. chairman staff does request uh, a continuance of item 5a 
407 El Salto Drive. The applicant has also requested the site to be continued to a future date. Okay. We can I do I make a motion that we can do that when we get there, huh? Any uh, commissioner comments? Then, okay, we're going to have a one. Well, oh. I'm just reminding everybody that the plein air, Capitol plein air event is happening this weekend all throughout the village. Actually, all week long, Saturday the artists will be down in the village and around town. Uh, head on out and take a look at people creating art. It's going to be fun. Let starting at 11 o'clock at New Brighton Middle School on Sunday. There will be a show and sale and a competition of all the artwork. Last year it was well attended and really fun. It's just great to see hundreds of paintings of Capitola and all the different ways people can do it. They paint night shots. They paint day shots. They get these little um, angles and places that you would never think anybody would want to paint a picture of, and yet it's beautiful and wonderful. So I recommend it highly. Hmm. I'll go ahead and read this uh, little announcement we have here. The meeting is being cable cast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and AT&T U-verse Channel 99 and is being recorded to be re replayed on the following Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Meetings can also be reviewed from the city's website at www.cfcapitola.org. Our technician tonight is Scott Gray. And as a reminder, please turn your cell phones to vibrate. Uh, while you're in the meeting and if you do come up to speak tonight we ask that you sign your name on the sheet at the podium and uh, give us your name for our records so with that I'll open up a public comment period the, this public comment period is for those items that are not on our scheduled uh, agenda night tonight so if you have something that's not on the agenda that you'd like to get up and speak to the Planning Commission uh, about we give you three minutes to do that Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and close that portion of the public comment period, and uh, we'll go to approval of our minutes from October 6th of our regular meeting. Do I have a motion for I move to approve. Commissioner Ortiz? To I'll second it. And Commissioner Westman, uh, first and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So that's approved. We'll move to our consent calendar. Uh, the consent calendar are items that are, uh, a motion is made uh, on one motion for all those items on the consent calendar. Tonight we have two items on our consent calendar. Um, and I guess I would ask if anybody would like to pull those from the audience or from our commissioner. Uh, I would like to pull item B. Item B, the sign permit. Okay. So I'll move the uh, remaining consent item. Okay, so we have a motion to uh, approve the rest of the consent calendar, item uh, A, for it. Do we have a second? Yes. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. So uh, we'll move uh, item 4B over to um, 5A, where I guess where the 407 was. That's all right. Thank you. So now we'll, uh, we will start our uh, the public hearing portion of it. I guess to start off, first let's deal with the uh, item A, 407 El Salto. Do we have a motion to continue that to December? I'll make a motion to continue it to December 1st. Okay, and a second? Second. So it's going to be, a, we're going to have to do a ton of heads. We need more people. Yeah. <laughs> we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So that is approved. So we'll start off with 4B then, which is uh, now the new 5A on uh, 231 Esplanade. Okay, thank you, Planning Commissioners. Good evening. Uh, before you this evening is a sign permit application for a new restaurant um, called Sotola Bar and Grill, and this will be located at 231 Esplanade Avenue. Esplanade. They're um, requesting approval of a projecting sign over the doorway, a wall sign along the wall that will be painted on, and also a menu sign. Um, here in blue, you can see the location of the property. Um, first, I'll talk about this, the Sotola projecting sign. The projecting sign is projects four feet out from the wall, and um, it's a foot and a half in height and three and three-quarter feet long, the actual sign itself. Uh, projecting signs under the code are 
only allowed to go out two feet from the wall, and so they were requesting an exception to that. The um, length of the sidewalk in this area is greater than nine feet wide, and so staff didn't think it would be an issue to project further over the sidewalk with this wall, with this sign. And here you can see an image of the sign, and due to the, there, uh, it definitely meets the eight foot requirement from the bottom of the sign to the sidewalk. Next, we'll talk about the wall sign. The wall sign is proposed at 10 and a half feet wide by almost four feet tall. The wall sign will be painted onto the facade of the building in black. Um, they're having a muralist, I believe, paint the sign onto the wall was their proposal. You can see the CL below that, and that is not part of the application. That's for the center, center line of the sign. It is not somebody's initials painted onto the wall. So that was, so it, it, it's just the wall painting up top. The third part of this application is a menu sign to be located by the side of the staircase. And a menu sign is required to not exceed three square feet, and the proposed menu sign is three square feet in size. So with that, staff recommends the Planning Commission approve the sign application for 231 Esplanade um, based on the findings and conditions in the staff report. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll talk to you. Yeah. Question of staff. Uh, what was your reasoning? <coughs> Uh, behind the larger, uh, not the wall sign, but the, the uh, projecting sign. The projecting sign. Uh, it was because of the width of the sidewalk. And why because of the width of the sidewalk? I mean, I, I don't understand the logic there. Um, because it, I, I guess you're, the, the sidewalks maybe along Capitola Avenue are probably about five feet in width. In this area, they are about nine feet, I think it's more than nine feet in that sidewalk. And so it it's over the sidewalk, but it's not more than halfway over the sidewalk. Um, Are there other locations in Capitola where the sidewalk is that wide? Along the Esplanade, there, you know, after so, we so just- theoretically, everybody in the Esplanade could have a sign this large as well. It could be wider than the two feet if, if we set up. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Okay. Uh, here from the public. Yeah, uh, well, I guess this is the applicant here. Yeah. Oh, would you like to, would you have questions of the applicant or you want to? Uh, I don't have questions of the applicant. Do you have anything you'd like to add before we talk about it? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Okay, is there anybody else from the audience who would like to uh, speak on this topic? If not, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to, or the uh, public comment period, bring it back to the commission. and. Uh, my reason for pulling the sign is that it is an internally illuminated sign. Uh, and in our new, I checked in our new zoning ordinance, we specifically state that we're not going to have uh, any internally illuminated signs uh, in the village. And I believe the current ordinance or the design guidelines for the village don't allow for an internally illuminated sign. So I could live with the sign, the size, how it is, if they could come up with a way to externally illuminate it rather than have the internal illumination. And I can clarify that um, on the illumination, it's halo lit, so it, it'll be similar to the Margaritaville sign, I but it is internally illuminated. I, yeah, I understand that, and I went down and I looked at the Margaritaville sign, and the difference with that one is that it's on the building itself. Um, you know, the way this one will project, um, you know, I think it will be the first of its kind to have this kind of sign in the village. And for me, um, I, I'm not comfortable with the internal illumination. But the size of the sign's fine with me. I don't have any objection to the wall sign or the menu sign. So if they were to do the same design with a gooseneck yes, lighting? Yes, that, that would work, work for me. Okay. Well, I agree with that. And I think it's important for us to continue to hold the line on signage in the village because the the natural beauty of the village is really what people love about Capitola and I think there's a there's a possibility of incremental larger signs this and that and and this the, the reason for this variance just doesn't seem strong enough for me I would prefer to keep it the size of the, all the others I would hate to see all the other businesses on the Esplanade come into us and say well these guys got it so I'd like to get it too 
You know, I do like the projecting signs. I think they're a really good idea. For this location, I think it's a great idea. There's already one there. Um, you know, this is, this is a four-foot sign. So we have to remember this is, this is, you know, if this is three feet, you know, this is a pretty large sign. It's not small. So I think keeping it closer to the building, keeping it, you know, smaller is better. So is there a size that would make you more comfortable? I think, I think we should just go with whatever uh, our, our code qu asks for without any variances. That's, that's what, I mean, give, give these people what everybody else gets. Yeah. If that size is what, is that size? It's the size of the sign is correct. It's the protruding part of how far it hangs out. Is that? Yeah, it's uh, not allowed to project more than, let me get the exact. Um. We're not talking about the si size of well, the sign. The size it's of, no size, size it's number is three nine. Yeah, it's four feet. No such sign shall project more than two feet over any public property or so, pedestrian vehicular easement. So this will affect the size of this sign as well, not only the projection of it, but the sign itself. And I just, I, it's my comments stand, I would rather see no variances on signs in the village. We, we've, you know, I think we're trying to, we've always tried to keep signs to a minimum in the village, and it's, it's the scale of the village. I don't know why it would have to be any larger. I, I think they'd have to redesign it to have more of a vertical emphasis to fit the two foot. Right. I, 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 I don't I, think can, that's. Can we talk about it a little uh, bit? Yeah, but I don't but think that's really scale. I don't think that's. I think it's going. I think it's going to be quite a bit larger than that. That's really I, not scale. I, I'm agreeing with you that I think four feet may be a, a little big. But I do, uh, I feel that, I think the two feet standard was put in place a number of years ago before we've gone on a campaign of widening the sidewalks and uh, trying to create more pedestrian space. Um, and, you know, I'm not certain that four feet is, isn't too much, but I'm not certain that two feet isn't too little. So for me personally, you know, I could sort of split it down the middle and go, uh, well, re really, it, I, I, I'm not concerned about the size. My, my issue really was that I didn't want it to be internally illuminated because I didn't want to see this big glowing sign, a four-foot glowing sign hanging off the building. But perhaps if they could shrink it back to three feet. Well, I just... I, when we make findings for a variance, to me it has to, it has to make sense. And the size of the sidewalk doesn't seem to relate to anything to, to me. I mean, I hear you. those kinds of things, you know, people will actually, if the, si if the sidewalk is wider, people will be back farther from the sign and be able to actually see it better. So I don't really understand why a wider sidewalk makes it so they have to have a, a larger sign. I don't see the relationship. If somebody else has to yeah. help us out here a little bit. What do you think they're... i just like right. to see it be... Well, I, either, I, either change our ordinance or come into compliance. Yeah, and, and I, I would agree with that. I, I hate to see us, you know, step outside the ordinance on an individual basis without some discussion about it. I don't have an issue with it sticking out further uh, over the sidewalk because I know the entryway has got that little bit of a step there and... And it is on a corner, so, um, but the size with the size is a is kind of a little bit of a, a different matter. But it seems to me like if it's two feet, then do we? What is the? Uh, I should have known this before we got here. But the depth. So if they do change it so it hangs down, so the, the other uh, direction, so it's perpendicular instead of uh, horizontal. Um, what would the dimensions be? Um, it would fit because it's six inches off the building and then the sign itself is one foot six inches. So if they took the sign and made it more like a flag. So you'd have the same size, but it would just be. Yeah, yeah, yeah they'd so. have to keep their eight foot clearance. Right. And the size would be fine as far as the square f footage of the sign. So they are in compliance with the total square footage of their signage. They are. Right, yeah, so. 
So I would be comfortable if that if we said that um, you know we would approve the application with the modifications on the projecting sign that it not be internally illuminated and that it conform um, to the normal city standards and that staff could you know, if it's basically consistent with what we've seen up here, uh, approve it without it coming back to the Planning Commission so they can go ahead and get their sign and uh, move forward with opening up their business. I'm not clear about what you're, at, what you're recommending for the protruding sign. I'm saying that the uh, protruding sign would conform to the two-foot requirement mm -hmm. for how far it stuck out from the building. Um, it can, the letters can go up and down if they choose to do that and redesign it that way and staff can approve those designs without it coming back to the Planning Commission and um, it will be externally illuminated. Yeah, I see it will change the graphics of how the S and the A tie in potentially, but that whole graphic there. Yeah, or it can just be small. Go down the sign. Okay. And, yeah. So um, currently, the sign is at six square feet, just a little under six square feet. Within the code, you're allowed to go up to 16 square feet. Would you like staff to keep it under to make sure it doesn't exceed the six square feet when it the protruding signs can go up to 16 square feet? Mm -hmm. the but they can only go two feet off the wall. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to. I want, I want some so clarity when it comes back in. See it conform within, you know, basically the six square feet. If it's over slightly, uh, sure. you know, we give staff the discretion yeah. to make that okay. call if they need it to make yeah. the graphics okay. fit. Okay. So, is, is Linda, are you are you okay with what? I I, I think we're good. Is that a motion? That's a motion. Okay. Second. So we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Okay, so although it doesn't sound like it, welcome to Capitola. <laughs> we hope you do well. Okay, so now we'll move on to item B, 4025 Bromer Street. And uh, who's on the staff report? Is that Katie? Okay. Thank you. The next item is for. 4025 Bromer Street, and this is a conceptual review. Um, we've had quite a few, the, the applicant had quite a few questions as they were moving through this project, and what they're proposing is a mixed-use uh, development with office space on the ground floor and then a duplex above, so two residential units above. And in looking at the site planning, as questions came up, we thought this might be a good one to bring before Planning Commission because... Um, the CC zone also discusses uh, for setbacks, it has to be in compliance with the 41st Avenue guidelines. And when it comes to guidelines, it's always good to get some guidance from the review board. So um, this evening, I'll walk you through the project, and then the applicant's architect is here as well, and he'll be here for uh, comments and questions. So. 4025 Bromer Street is the third property in on Bromer Street on the north side. Uh, it's a unique property in that the CC zone is within six properties on Bromer Street within the new zoning code update. We've talked about those last three properties transferring from CC to actually multifamily in the future. So if that were to be adopted as proposed, this would be the last property within the CC zone before you get to... Um, the multifamily, and it's um, across the street is the Fairfield Inn. There's also a, a planned development across the street, and then, of course, our community commercial zoning district along 41st Avenue. So 4025 Bromer Street, here's an existing, a picture of the existing site. There's quite a bit of established vegetation around the site that uh, provides a buffer between the properties that surround 20, 4025 Bromer. I'm going to walk you through the site. Um, currently, there's a single-family home to the west and a duplex to the east. 
um, within the 41st Avenue guidelines, it suggested that the off-street parking be located toward the rear of the building and that street frontages should be devoted towards the buildings and landscaping. It also specifies that this requirement may be varied for special site features. The applicant is following this guideline and placing the eight parking spaces towards the rear of the building. The circulation will be off the west side. It'll, the entrance will be off the west side of the property and along where the single family home is to the west. There's a 15 foot setback on the front of the property. So the logical place in which to place the building is where you see it in yellow. Uh, we'll take a closer look at this. One of the conversation points that the applicant would like to have this evening is regarding encroachments on the front um, this, what I just highlighted, is the second story deck that's proposed. This encroaches four feet into the front uh, landscape area. And this is the entry cover over the entryway um, that encroaches seven feet into the 15-foot front yard. There's also, um, which can be seen on this slide, a roof overhang that encroaches two feet within the front yard. So within the code, it says landscaped areas of front yard shall be set back 15 feet in accordance to the 41st Avenue design guidelines. So it's not clearly a front yard setback. It's a landscaped area is how it's worded and that it must be in accordance with the design guidelines. There's no list of allowed encroachments within the area of the front landscape. And as I've already stated, the roof overhang is proposed to encroach two feet. The second story deck is proposed at four feet and then the covered entryway at seven feet. So I'll introduce some of the 41st Avenue design guidelines that are associated with this application. One is that entries should be protected from wind, rain, and sun and provide a distinct entrance to the building. Second is that the building shall use design elements that provide a sense of human scale, such as insets and overhangs. Elements of pedestrian interest shall be included at the ground floor levels, such as courtyards and display windows. And then next is the previous uh, requirement that the off-street parking be located in the back and that the front of the building should be devoted towards building and landscaping and that, that there's some flexibility in that site feature. Um, next, I'll go talk to you about the side yards. So there's a duplex to the east. The duplex is, list, is 15 feet from the property line. Um, the duplex is an existing non-conforming structure. So a residential structure within the community commercial zone cannot expand as a residential structure. If they wanted to redevelop this as either a mixed use with residential as the project is before you or some type of commercial property, at that time they could expand the use and it would be become a commercial use or a mixed use project. So for the life of the duplex, it will remain 15 feet from the east property line. Um, that was hard to see, but I just did the roof overhang. So the yellow is the roof overhang. The roof overhang actually comes right up to the property line. So the east facade of this building or the east side of the building is located two feet from the property line. And then they're um, proposing that the actual roof overhang would be right at the property line. So the first discussion point that the applicant would like um, to discuss is those encroachments that go into the into the front yard landscaped area and whether or not um, you find that they're in compliance with the design guidelines and that flexibility within the setbacks to um, be under the 41st Avenue design guidelines or should the applicant be applying for a variance to the front yard um, standards. I should also note that all of those features do not touch the ground in the front yard. They're all overhangs or uh, suspended. Um, so, and then the next item that they would like to talk about is the placement of the building. As I walked th you through the front, the first slide of where parking is located and the setback from the single family to the west, they'd like um, for the direction of the placement of the building is correct as they're pushing it closer to 41st Avenue um, on the east. So with that, um, that's my, concludes my presentation. And I'm here for any questions, and the applicant is here as well. Okay, any questions of staff? Yeah, I have a couple, but go ahead. My question is regarding the slide previous to this one. Um, 
support findings, so it would be findings for a variance, correct? Well, because there's flexibility in design guidelines and the way in which it's worded within the zoning code, so it wouldn't necessarily have to be a variance. We, we think making findings for a variance could be challenging because it's a flat lot right. um, and where it's, it's a landscaped area. And let me just go back. So what would the this the findings differ from variance findings then? I mean, how would they be stated in the conditions or whatever? We, we could make a finding um, on this slide for the, the third, the off-street parking, and that the requirement may be varied for special site features. So within, we, we could make findings that it meets the 41st Avenue design guidelines and that the encroachments are allowed because okay. they comply with the 41st Avenue design guidelines. Well, I'm, not, <coughs> I'm not understanding why these are encroachments yet. Uh, isn't that guideline for the purpose of landscaping? And we're talking about some uh, elements of the building uh, above the landscaping? I guess it could interfere with tall trees. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's one of the reasons we wanted to bring it to the Commission's uh, attention and have you evaluate it. From my perspective, when you call a landscape strip, that's not a setback. And I think a projection above that landscaped area would be fine. But I can see that a reasonable person might come up with a different interpretation as well. So can we go back to the slide that, <coughs> slide that showed the site plan? That one? So um, I just have a couple of questions. Are, are there requirements for setback f for parking spaces next to a residential unit? Some sort of landscape strip? There's a two-foot landscape strip requirement um, along a driveway that would be required. Right. So mm -hmm. this, this wouldn't provide any of that. So that was something that I didn't bring into the conceptual review, but it would be required. So I'd work with the applicant on that and ensure that they provide the two-foot landscape strip. Right. And, and the building is being proposed to be, for me, uh, to north, south, the eastern side, closer so they can get the driveway width and the building in there. But are there any standard setback requirements? No. And I think, isn't there a requirement for the land, the back of the property to have some landscaping, parking when it abuts? Because is that resident, isn't that residential behind it? Mm -hmm. We would, uh, I believe there is a, a wall requirement where it's a commercial use uh, for a masonry wall. And I would have to look into the landscaping to make sure that if there's a landscaping buffer, that that also be included. Okay, any other questions for staff? Would the applicant like to come up and speak? Hi, my name is Jason Woolley. I'm an architect from Lot C Architecture. And um, thank you so much for doing this conceptual review um, so that we just get a good understanding. We were feeling like this site being in the CC zone, there's actually not a lot of rules and we don't have a lot of guidance as to what we can and can't do. And simply we're just trying to create a nice mixed use project um, that has that commercial at the bottom and try to have a decent amount of office space down there. It's about almost 900 square feet that we're proposing. Um, and we just don't want it to get too small. So we're because we're putting that parking in the back, it shoves the building up front and it makes us think that It'd be nice if we could do some of these projections into that front landscape area. Really, really it's not a setback. So um, anyways, with the lack of guidance as to what would and wouldn't be allowed in this CC zone, we kind of want to defer to you to get some guidance before we formally submit um, and really spend the time to design the building and, and have it completely worked out. This still is very conceptual, even though we have, right. you know, 3D views and stuff. So uh, any questions from Jason? Well, I, I have one. In, in looking at the site and looking at what you're proposing to do, what concerns me a little bit is circulation in and out of the property. Uh, it's a little bit of an awkward intersection to start with right now. 
and you're going to be adding with this project uh, quite a few trips in and out of the building. So, uh, what would drive the decision in terms of what side to put the driveway on? What might be the traffic, some traffic engineering, I would think, to, in terms of what would work better from a circulation standpoint. I don't know if you've got. I don't that agree. Point. I disagree, or I agree with you that that's a tough spot, that intersection, 41st and, and Bromer. And I think the the side that we have the driveway on is our best option because if would, the closer you get to that intersection, the worse it is. I mean, trying to pull out there and make a left to sometimes is impossible because that light, you know, is kind of a long one, right? And people get backed up along there making a left on a 41st. Yeah, plus there's an island there. So I think it's I think it's you know having it on that side is our best side. It also happens to be. Uh, that side that, you know, the existing single family uh, structure adjacent to us is closer. So it's kind of nice that we pull the building away from that west side, um, especially because one thing we're doing, you know, by tearing down the existing and building new is we are taking advantage of this 40 foot height limit and putting some residential up above. You might um, have to go to like a right turn only coming out of like. Sort of like well, that. certainly, I've thought about it myself, that if I worked there, that I probably would pretty much always make a right <laughs> coming out of there. I don't know if that's something that we can require necessarily, but um, but I personally would probably try to do that unless you get up there. I was literally just thinking about this the other day and thinking that, well, shoot, oh, it's clear. There's nobody hanging at the light. I can make a left, you know. <laughs> I think it's yeah. only a requirement. It's not a requirement. It's only a recommendation. Sure. It's on private property anyway. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with Jason that the driveway is on the correct side. It gets it further away from the island that's at that intersection. But honestly, I didn't really – I was there today. I didn't really see a problem getting across. Uh, there are times when it's busier, obviously. There but, are times. And they come shooting across from Jade over yeah. to that. But um, And it's got that weird curvy thing. Right. You know, I'm sure that makes it better, whatever is going on there. But but I think with that island set back, you're a little bit of ways. I, I don't think it's, you know, undoable this way. Yeah. How about the rest of – any other recommendations yeah, or we want to talk like, about the question? It's good looking. I, well, I, I will wait till we – I have a question. I'm assuming because it's only conceptual, there's no landscaping included now, but there will be landscaping. We do actually have a landscape plan right now. We pulled together a really basic That's one, fine. you know. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, the plan is to actually certainly the first 15 feet off the property line, but we also have five feet to the uh, sidewalk too. So really we have 20 feet of landscaping is what we're planning. Now that was going to be one of my questions. So has Public Works indicated that there's any uh, proposal in the near future to widen this street? So I talked with Publ Public Works and they would want to take in a deposit for the improvements to the sidewalk so that when they, this is an area that they do think that sidewalks should be improved but they want to do it contiguously okay. and at the same well, time. I meant so. widen the street. He did not refer to widening. Because in my opinion, first of all, I agree with Commissioner Newman. I think that a 15-foot landscape strip, strip, if you have encroachments on the second or third story, that's not encroaching on the landscape space itself. And um, there is, I believe, it looks like about five feet from the back of where the sidewalk will be to where the property line is. So for me, I could see the building coming closer to the street uh, in order to, you know, perhaps you provide some landscaping at the rear of the property, not just the wall back there, if that does abut a residential use. I can't, I just can't remember. I keep trying to think what was, Go back to that other slide. What was behind it. Uh, those, are, those are condos. No. Yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah. mm -hmm. Right. It's so. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. So you know, for for me, there could be some flexibility um, as far as the front yard setback is concerned. I would like to see, you know, some landscaping in there, maybe a minimum of ten feet or so, because it is next to what is a residential unit that's going to stay residential, but. Um, uh, you know, that, that front space perhaps could be used a little better in their design and maybe if they got more space, five more feet in the front, then they could come in a little bit on uh, the east side so it's not quite close on that 
property line right there. So there, again, might be some potential for, for something to go in there. I mean, I, I, I don't see that if we get 15 feet of landscaping, does it all have to be 15 feet on their property or they're going to landscape the city property for us anyway as well? If you're done with Jason, I'll let him go and then okay. open up to public. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. So at this uh, time, we'll open up for uh, anybody else of the public that would like to come up and address this issue. Yes, I'm uh, Bart Hoekstede. I'm actually the resident that owns the house on the west side of 4025. Um, I understand we're in a creek uh, in a conceptual review right now, and this is all still at that phase. In the short time that we had available, uh, my wife and I came up with some concerns that we have living right next to a, a development that 40 feet is an awfully high building. So I'm just going to go by what I wrote down and not ramble on here. Um, privacy. Uh, what impact will the proposed, proposed development have on the privacy barrier pre presently provided by the row of 12 mature 18 to 20 foot tall juniper trees along the length of the west property line, which is our house, of the proposed development property? Similar juniper privacy barriers exist for the east north properties adjoining development property as well. The proposed three story, 40 foot, I would imagine ridge height of the building overpowers the existing one story residences both on the east and the west of the proposed, uh, proposed development. This results in a significant, significant loss of privacy for both neighbors from this imposing and massive super scale structure, 40 feet tall. Um, on plan view A11, the distance from the property line to the nearest wall on the west side of my residence is shown as eight nine. That's incorrect. It's five foot six. So from the actual distance as measured by the residents is five six. This means that the distance between the proposed structure and the west side residence is actually seventeen six, not twenty foot nine, as A one one shows. Page 51 states, the applicant provided greater separation along the east side to create a buffer for the mixed use by placing the driveway approach to the rear of the parking lot along the east property line. I believe uh, the plan view A, I'm sorry, the plan view A11 shows a driveway on the west side of the property to be developed. So I think that's a mistake where they actually said it's the east side and it's the west side which is our property line side. Um, if a two foot buffer on the west side property line were incorporated, this would allow the Juniper privacy barrier to remain and mitigate most privacy loss concerns of the west side neighbor. What, and then I have a couple uh, other, one issue is this, this first floor commercial space, what are the limitations for its use? So, are they going to be able to put anything they want in there? Can it be manufacturing? I know it's a, a small space. We want to, We would like to know how it's going to be used. We're right next door to it. Um, and then lastly and very importantly is parking. Um, you folks were talking about <clears throat> easement out of there. Uh, that is a nightmare street. Um, during rush hour, people back up from 41st Avenue all the way to 38th. With the hotel going in, they took away the right turn lane, and so now everybody backs up to 38th, and everybody wants to get home quickly, and it gets pretty crazy there. So it's already bad, but um, per local standard, uh, I'm sorry, per local code regulations, parking must be available to accommodate two spaces per living unit, and based on square footage, eight units for the commercial space. This does not take into account parking for the commercial entity's employees. As, ev as is evidenced by the current reality in this neighborhood, parking is already at a premium for residents because employees of New Leaf Shopping Center, the Fairfield Hotel, as well as hotel guests whose vehicle height exceed the parking garage limitation, put additional strain on available resident parking. Additionally, recent reconfiguration of 38th Avenue to include a bake bike lane has eliminated one whole side of, of that parking for residential parking 
on the east side, and that's further exasperated the problem for parking on that street. It's bad. So that's preconceptual for me. If it goes further, then we'll, we'll have more concerns. Thank you, sir. Okay. Do we have anybody else tonight that would like to address this? Hello, I, I'm the uh, property owner of the condominium, uh, the fourplex behind uh, this building. We're, we're at a diagonal to it. We're, we're abutting to it. And what we're concerned is, well, first of all, we think it's a that's tall, narrow building that's been shoehorned into this lot. I don't think it's congruent to what we want to be in, the, in this area. It's just, I think the lot's too narrow and the building's too tall for it to... Uh, uh, for it to be okay, I, I think it's also. I think people are looking from the hotel at this structure. It almost to me looks like a fort. The way it is, tall, wooden, narrow structure. I don't think it's something we want in Capitol to be a part of our our view for the next half a century. So I just think that it should not be three story. It should be at most two story. And I also think that parking lot in back with eight parking spaces. Imagine you're parking your your car on the at uh, the back in there on the right, and the parking lot's full, and now you have to back your car out. I don't think the turning radius is sufficient for you to get your car turned around and go out the front way and with your car uh, toward the street. Uh, you almost have to back up into the street because I don't think there's enough turning space for any car if there's if you have those spots full. Um, so anyway, that's my concern. I think it's too tall. I think it's too narrow. I don't think it looks like uh, what we want for capital. I mean, especially if you go up and down 41st Street and see all these nice retail uh, places that are really well designed and looks nice. And then we go into this this retail place, and I don't think it's it's what we want. Anyway, thank you, sir. Okay. Anybody else that would like to come up and talk about this project? How are you? I'm Jacob Heinz. I live uh, two doors down there on the west, and really my main concern is just the looks of it. When you cut down this road, you're going to have a massive three-story building kind of out of place, and uh, in terms of planning, I just don't think it's going to look too nice. Of course, I'm slightly concerned with privacy, but can't really do much about that. I just feel the, the look of Capitola, it is going to look really um, out of place, so I think for planning-wise, it's in everybody's best decision to uh, maybe shorten that a little bit, to not have a three-story building with two little houses on the corner and then little houses further on down the road. So that's just how I feel about it. Thank you. Wait, a question for Mr. Hines. Uh, his property would, st would be in the new zoning uh, change, and I'm just wondering if the two people who came up and spoke know that their houses, their, where their houses stand, are in for zoning changes. So in the future, you might be selling your property for larger units going in there. Correct. It would be so larger. Now it's sort of a buffer zone, right. and yet in the future it's meant to. Oh, not yeah. You can be a larger. Um, not those three lots were going to go from CC to residential. Multifamily. Yeah, they'll be multifamily residential, and they'll be. So right now they're not able to expand their homes at all as right. residential, so it'll give them the ability to uh, add on to their homes. Right. But I don't believe that's going to be allowed to go up to three stories, if I'm correct. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Okay, seeing uh, no one else coming forward, we'll close uh, public comments and bring it back to the commission for discussion. Well, the height could be an issue for, for me, particularly since it is, you know, sort of the transition lot there from commercial to residential and um, you know I see no real reason why the commercial space needs to be 15 feet tall uh, considering you know the, the size of it and perhaps if they uh, looked at the residential units and you know maybe added a loft or something rather than the whole other story there but it seems like you could get it down to 
um, you know, because I think the height limit in the multifamily is 30 something. Eight, it's in the 30s, yeah. You know, the, I, I will. More compatible with what's going to, to be next door to them. This strikes me uh, just on first impression as a slight overbuilding of the site. Uh, it's a pretty dramatic intensification of what's there already. I certainly would not do a plan that required any variances because this is a plain, square, rectangular, flat lot, and we're, I don't see how we could ever satisfy the requirements for the state law requirements for any variances on setbacks of any kind here. So, I mean, that's out to start with. But I know it's it's a little more flexible in this because it's in the 41st Avenue area, but yet it's it's not in the heart of the 41st Avenue area. It's in a transition area. So mm -hmm. I, I think what we're saying is basically something on a kind of a scale that reflects the fact that this is a transition between 41st Avenue and between a residential neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would definitely have to have things like the two foot of landscaping yeah. and uh, those kinds of things to soften the impact of it on its adjacent neighbors. And certainly the parking in the back would be look have a much finer look at it when they actually come in because it does look, you know, a little bit like there's a there's gonna be a little difficulty getting in and out of some of those spaces that are to the east. Um, you know, so I, I just don't see how you're gonna get that many spaces in there and get all the landscaping you want. So I do think that's something that's going to have to get looked at. I agree with what Commissioner Westman said, and I, but I don't have a problem with uh, some of the uh, second story overhangs uh, at all. So, but I think the height needs to come down a bit. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't have any concerns so much about the encroachment part into the front area. And that, you know, and because it is vague, it's, it's a little subjective, and that subjectivity not only leads uh, a little area for you to, um, you know, have some concerns and, and freedom in, but it also leads some subjectivity to the opinions up on the commission. So, um, and by the time you come through with this plan, uh, I know you're probably going to have one or two d new commissioners and may have a different perspective, but I, I would agree with the rest of my fellow commissioners and some of the uh, people who came up and spoke that it is on that transition area from um, what we're seeing in the commercial into that multifamily. And at some point, that multifamily will happen, I, I would assume, in this area. Uh, maybe not in the next 10, 20 years, maybe. But because of the zoning and the cost, at some point, it may become feasible. So um, I would agree that I'd like to see it uh, personally be more, uh, you know, suited to so it transitions into that multifamily area. Chairman um, Welch. I think the, the requirements for the CC zoning district are based on people typically having large lots and, um, you know, putting a 40-foot building on a lot this size doesn't seem appropriate to me. I'd like to ask one more question to the commission. There is a, within the conditional use permit standards for a multi, uh, for a mixed-use building in the CC, there's a requirement that the first story is 15 feet minimum in height. So it, it sounds like there's a preference for the height to come down, so maybe there would be support in almost a, a backwards variance for bringing down the height and not requiring the 15-foot minimum on the first story. And, right. and the so. second and third had 9-foot ceiling heights, right? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's some flexibility in there, I would think. To yeah. That doesn't really address the question that maybe it's a little bit too much for the site. I mean, right. it really... I know everyone wants to maximize their property, but you know, what's right for this site in terms of fitting the parking in, the access is, is a problem, the height is a problem because of the size of the lot, so maybe two stories makes more sense? I don't know. That would be my, yeah. you know, my first uh, inclination. And although I won't be on the Planning Commission when this comes to the Planning Commission, I'm really in favor of keeping as much of that current vegetation as possible. Well, the, yeah, the current vegetation there really does give some privacy all the way around. So that, that's a nice uh, part of about the property. But um, there, There's uh, one more standard in the code that when you do a multi, when you do a mixed use development, it's required that it be a multi-family on, so they'd be required to have a minimum of two dwellings 
dwelling units. So would there, is that a standard that the applicant could look at a single unit on the second story if there was a? I, yeah, I think this is an unusual lot in that zoning. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be able to make variances for the size of the, size of the lot. You know, we're, we're right. Mm -hmm. I, think, I, I, I agree with that. I think, uh, you know, as I said before, the CC regulations are for much larger parcels that, you know, are really on 41st Avenue. And, um, uh, you know, these, these little small lots here don't sort of fall under that criteria. So I think it's more important to come up with something that fits the neighborhood and fits the site than it is to, um, you know, follow those guidelines. So, yeah, hopefully that gives you a little bit of direction. And actually, I'm excited to see that we're starting to move towards, uh, you know, uh, doing the zoning change and getting down that to that area. We're getting some new development there, but um, hopefully that gave some direction to you, Jason, tonight to move forward and, and uh, see what the new uh, commission has to say next year. <laughs> Any other comments? Is, it, is, is that all you had? Did we answer all the questions we needed to answer for? Yes. I'm sure you. Jason will have many more, but... Um, Hopefully we answer all those questions tonight. Okay, so um, no action needed to be taken on, on uh, that. We'll move forward to item C, 226 Monterey Avenue. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, before you is an application for a design permit for an addition to an existing two-story single-family home as well as the construction of a detached secondary dwelling unit with a variance request to the maximum 80% uh, valuation for improvements to a non-conforming structure. The project is also in the coastal zone and requires a coastal development permit. So the subject property is in the R1 zoning district just north of the central village. Uh, the property fronts along Monterey Avenue, but is accessed through a 12-foot wide easement at the rear off of Central Avenue, as seen in these blue arrows. The applicant is proposing to maintain the existing location of the front of the home and add on to the rear. The addition area is shown in dark gray. Uh, the applicant is proposing to add 191 square feet of basement area below grade and 642 square feet at the back of the main residence. Behind the home, the applicant is proposing a 480 square foot secondary dwelling unit. So here you can see the existing and proposed elevations. Uh, this slide specifically shows the front of the home along Monterey Avenue. The exterior of the home would be completely updated within the pro proposed remodel. The front facade of the home would be updated to include large picture windows. Uh, the applicant's proposing stone veneer siding for the exterior of the first floor along the front of the home. Here you can see the south side elevations, both existing and proposed. As you can see, the property slopes down towards the front of the home along Monterey Avenue. The first story would have cement plaster exterior finish at the back of the residence as it slopes below grade. Uh, the second story of the main residence would consist of wood shingle siding, clear anodized metal roofing, and glass railing along the second story deck. So here's the north side elevation. The height of the finished home would be 24 feet 11 inches above grade at its highest point, which is compliant with the 25 foot height limit in the R1 zoning district. And then here you can see the existing and proposed rear elevation of the home. Um, this slide shows the proposed north and south side elevations of the detached secondary dwelling unit. The unit would contain the same wood shingle siding and clear anodized metal roofing as the main residence. The unit complies with all the development standards for secondary dwelling units, including the 15 foot height limit. So here are the proposed east and west side elevations of the secondary dwelling unit. Uh, please note that there, 
the siding shown on the east side elevation is incorrect in the plans and on this slide. Um, it's supposed to be shingle siding, not lap siding. And so then it would match the other three elevations. So here's the existing site plan. Uh, the residence is non-conforming in that it does not meet front or side yard setbacks. And in addition, the detached carport does not meet the rear yard setback requirements. And now here's the proposed site plan. The project, the proposed project would not exacerbate existing setback encroachments and all the new addition work shown in blue would meet current setback requirements. The code allows a non-conforming structure to be modified as long as the total cost of the work does not exceed 80% of the present fair market value of the structure. The applicant is requesting a variance from this 80% rule to allow the existing front of the building to remain uh, as is or to remain where it is. So the Planning Commission may grant a variance when it finds that there's special circumstances applicable to the property or where strict application of the code would deprive the property owner of privileges enjoyed by others in the vicinity. This slide shows the existing development pattern surrounding 226 Monterey. The east side of Monterey Avenue is characterized with large, large homes built above Monterey Avenue. A variance to the allowed structural alteration calculation would allow the subject property to maintain its current location with a reduced front and side yard setback. As can be seen in this slide, uh, a variance to this 80% rule to allow the residents to maintain its existing location on Monterey Avenue would not constitute a special privilege. A majority of the buildings are built past the required 15-foot front yard setback. That red dotted line shows a rough estimate to where that 15-foot setback is, and then the star shows the subject property. Um, so therefore, staff recommends the Planning Commission approve of the variance to the maximum 80% rule for structural alterations to existing non-conforming properties and approve of the design permit to remodel and add on to 226 Monterey and for the construction of a new secondary dwelling unit. And that concludes my presentation. Thanks, Ryan. Any questions of staff? Not at this time. Is the applicant here? Would they like to... Derek? Good evening. Commissioner's Derek Van Alstyne. Uh, I'm the designer for the project and uh, represent the owners. Um, this, is a, this is a very interesting project in that <clears throat> there are a lot of conditions that are pre-existing that need to be corrected. And in order to leave the residence where it is, just the just the foundation work um, to rectify the inadequacies of the current structure would probably set it over the 80 percent. So um, it's uh, it was built very uh, sparingly uh, when it was built, and the the foundation is um, it, it definitely needs to be upgraded and brought up to current standards, and. In doing so, um, we, we, it's a ripple effect. Um, what we're adding, uh, we tried to, in, uh, to facilitate uh, the, the uh, zoning requirements um, in, in, in every aspect of it, and we worked closely with staff, and thank staff for the time that we spent doing it. So I urge you to uh, support this, uh, uh, this project and uh, support the variances uh, to leave the house where it is. Um, if you have questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Any questions, of Derek? Doesn't look like it right now. Thanks. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have anyone else here that would like to, um, from the public, that would like to speak on this project? Good evening, I'm Kurt Langhoff, and uh, we live at 224 Monterey Avenue, and uh, we're very familiar with the location of the, of the house, and um, they've been very good at working and showing us what they're planning to do, including us in some of their discussions, and we're very 
thrilled and excited that the place is going to be rebuilt and, and uh, we support it 100%. Thank you, thank you, Kurt. Anybody else would like to speak tonight on this project? Okay, seeing none, I'll go ahead and close uh, public comment and bring it back to the commission for discussion. Who's to start? Okay. I'm ready to make a motion. Is anybody else wanting to discuss anything? Uh, yeah, I want to take this opportunity to comment on the uh, variance uh, presentation just a bit because the requirements for a variance, as I understand them, and you can clarify, are that there has to be a special circumstance, which I think there clearly is here, by the way, because of the topography, if nothing else. There has to be a special circumstance, period. It's not or it doesn't constitute a privilege. You, just because 10 other houses uh, violate the side yard setbacks it it does, not, make it right. does not give you the, the uh, finding of a special circumstance. So you, you, and the Capitola ordinance would be the source of that confusion, but if you go back to the state law, you'll see that it's very clear that you have to have a special circumstance and there can't be a privilege. Right. So both, both are easy to find here in any event. So I, I think it's a great uh, improvement to uh, the property and uh, totally support it. Good. Well, it looks like yeah, we're ready for a motion, I guess. I'll make my motion to approve the application. So we have a motion to approve. A second? I'll second. We have a second from uh, Commissioner Newman. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Congratulations. That went much easier than I had thought. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We needed one. Okay, so now we'll move on to uh, item D, 105 Sacramento Avenue. And Ryan, you're doing this presentation also? Okay. All right. Before you is an application for a design permit to demolish an existing residence and secondary dwelling unit and the construction of a new two-story residence with variance requests for height, setbacks, and driveway landscaping. The subject property is located adjacent to the bluff within the R1 single-family residential zoning district and the geologic hazards district, being that it is right along the bluff. The existing property is considered a flag lot due to the L-shaped lot with 20 feet of street frontage along Sacramento Avenue. The street frontage is required for vehicular access. The applicant is proposing to demolish the existing residence, secondary dwelling unit, and carport and construct a new 3,321 square foot two-story residence and detached garage. The detached garage and three uncovered parking spaces will be located within the access portion of the lot. <coughs> So this slide shows the proposed north and south elevations of the home with the south elevation facing the ocean. The finished home would have cement fiber lap siding with large windows and a standing seam metal roof. Here you can see the proposed side elevations. Uh, there are two-story residences on either side of these uh, side elevations. So this slide shows the proposed front and side elevation of the detached garage off of Sacramento. The other two sides of the elevations do not have any windows or doors, so that's why they're not shown here. Behind the proposed garage and parking area are three extremely large cypress trees, two of which the owner would like to preserve, so they would be removing the middle one. And here you can see the existing cypress trees. Um, and again, the applicant is proposing to remove the weaker of the three, which is the middle one. And then this slide shows the trees looking south. And here's a shot of the trees looking north. So this slide shows the existing backyard area. Um, of 105 Sacramento and the neighbors on either side. 
And then here's the same view with their elevation uh, superimposed onto the image. So the applicant is requesting a variance from the driveway landscaping requirement, setbacks of both the residence and detached garage, and the maximum allowed building height. So first we will discuss the driveway landscaping. The code requires two feet of landscaping in the front yard between uncovered parking spaces and the side property line. The access way off of Sacramento Avenue is only 20 feet wide and uncovered parking spaces are required to be 10 feet wide. So two side-by-side -side parking spaces would cover the entire 20 foot wide access way. Instead of reducing the width of the uncovered parking spaces, staff recommends the Planning Commission grant a variance to waive the two foot landscape strip requirement. This would not be considered the grant of a special privilege since most properties are not flag lot properties and have more than 20 feet to provide parking and landscaping within the front yard area. So the applicant is also proposing um, a detached garage shown here in purple within the access portion of the property. And this does require variance to setbacks. The zoning code does not contain specific setback requirements for structures within the access portion of a flag lot. And then due to the owner's desire to preserve the large cypress trees, there is no location for the garage which would meet setback requirements without placing a driveway over the tree roots. The applicant has already pushed back the proposed garage as far away from the street as possible. Staff believes that special circumstance findings can be made due to the presence of the mature cypress trees, and therefore staff supports the variance request to the side yard setbacks of the detached garage. The applicant is also requesting a variance from side yard setbacks for the second floor of the residence. The 50 foot wide property requires a seven and a half foot side yard setback for the second floor. The applicant is proposing only five feet on the east side and six feet on the west. The red area shows the portion of the second floor that would not meet side yard setback requirements. Uh, staff does not support the variance request to side yard setbacks on the second floor. The applicant is proposing a relatively large two-story residence. Although the property has additional constraints of a cliff top setback uh, and the tree preservation, the buildable area of the property is 50 feet wide. There are many lots within the Depot Hill neighborhood that are less than 50 feet wide. Um, the applicant could redesign the second story floor plan to be in compliance with required second floor or second floor side yard setbacks. So lastly, the applicant is applying for a variance to height requirements. Um, they would like to build the main residence up to 26 feet 8 inches when the code limits it to 25 feet. Uh, the reasoning for the variance here is for the preservation of the cypress trees. Um, the trees have pushed the existing residence up 12 to 16 inches due to the very shallow root system. The applicant has contracted a certified arborist and is proposing a hybrid pier and grade beam foundation for the new home. The foundation would actually be hand dug so the tree route roots can be mapped and then piers can be placed at variable locations between the roots. The hybrid foundation system will result in a foundation that ranges from two and a half feet to three feet above grade. Although the tree preservation will create an unusually large foundation, staff believes a reasonably sized home could still be designed to avoid the trees while complying with height regulations. On the first story, the front of the home has a proposed eight foot, six inch wall height, while the rear has a 10 foot, four inch wall height. Staff recommends that the applicant redesign the home so that it complies with height limits, and therefore staff uh, recommends denial of the height variance. So staff recommends Planning Commission deny the variance to side yard setbacks and height of the main residence and approve variances to setbacks of the detached garage and driveway landscaping requirements, and thus approve the new two-story residence at 105 Sacramento Avenue as conditioned in the staff report. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Any questions of staff? Okay, no questions of uh, the applicant, Derek? Very 
Gordon Van Alstyne again for the holders um, who are the owners of the property. Um, this is a very unusual circumstance. Uh, these these trees uh, dominate this property and all the surrounding properties around it. Um, they affect five different properties. Designing uh, uh, this project was um, uh, challenging, <laughs> interesting, and uh, the solutions that we came up with are uh, actually quite novel. Uh, the the mapping of the roots uh, is a, is an interesting thing all in itself. It all has to be the re existing house has to be uh, demolished. The the roots have to be then exposed by hand. Then we have to map the roots, <laughs> and then we have to design a foundation where we have piers that go down uh, between the roots so that we're not af affecting the, the the larger roots. And then we're building uh, grade beams on top of those piers um, that will take cantilevers uh, of a two-story house over the root system. So uh, that's that's what's creating this height problem is that we have allowed for enough room to get a large enough grade beam in there that we can cantilever great distances. We may have to go up to six feet with a grade beam holding up a two-story house. So that that grade beam uh, could get up as high as 36 inches. So the first floor, we've allowed some extra height in there. Um, the house is actually will actually be stepped down because once we get towards the ocean, we're not going to have the surface roots that we have at the back of the house. Um, so it actually steps down so that we can take advantage of that height that we had to create in, in, in the first section of the house from the trees towards the ocean. So what, what happens with this parcel is that we have a geological setback that's coming from the ocean side. We have the trees uh, that are uh, <laughs> pushing us from the other direction. We have uh, the side yard setbacks and the height and the roots. So basically what we're doing is we're creating a cube, sort of, in the air <laughs> that we, if you push it in one direction, it's going to go another direction, given that you're trying to develop uh, the allowable square footage. So uh, I think that uh, if this were uh, a parcel that didn't have trees on it, we would be looking at variances probably to the front yard setback, and we'd be pulling the house back, and we'd, we'd, we'd then comply with all the other regulations. So what happens is when we squeeze it one way, it's, it's going to bulge out the other way. Um, the, the other thing that uh, is interesting about this parcel is that there, uh, there's a two-story sidewall uh, on the house next door on Sacramento, and there's a, there's a two-story residence with no windows on, I think it's 106 Hollister. Um, so the... Asking for a variance for the sidewalls it doesn't really affect anybody. Nobody, nobody will see that. The public won't see it. Um, it I don't think it'll uh, adversely affect the neighbors. Um, they, the 106 Hollister doesn't have any windows there, and we pulled the house back from that corner, so 106 Hollister still has the view across this property, past the edge of the 15-foot tall hedge. <laughs> which is on the other side of the property and shields this property uh, from the two-story facade on, on Sacramento. So we're basically, you know, uh, confined to uh, a three-dimensional block that, that really can't move much. Um, if we were to lower the roof and... Um, lower the height of the structure to the height limit, we'd end up with a building that wouldn't be very attractive. Um, it can be done, but it, it's certainly not uh, attractive. And I, and I think the, the findings are, could be made easily for the variance on the height due to the tree roots. I mean, this, this project is all about these trees. We spent a great deal of time... Um, working this out so that we could save the trees and, and build the house that the holders would like to have. So um, with that,
Uh, I'll conclude my remarks. I, I think the I think the, the the driveway portion and the garage is pretty much self-explanatory, and it's pretty much in the same spot that the garage and the parking is now. Anyway, it's it's just a replacement basically for the existing parking conditions. So I urge you to support the the variances. This is the first time in many 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 applications that I've uh, I've come to you with um, findings that weren't supported by staff. So it's kind of difficult for me. N normally we were able to work it out uh, so that there's uh, we're not asking for the the kind of variances we're asking for here. It, this is a, a very unusual circumstance. It's, it's a difficult parcel to work with, and there are certainly uh, there, there's the ability to make findings to to support the variances. Thanks, I'll be Dave. glad to take questions. Any Thanks, questions, Dave. Any questions for Derek? No. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. This uh, portion will open up to uh, for public comment from Heather. Individuals like to speak about this project. Is there anybody that would like to come and speak? Come forward. Hello. Hello. My name is Chris O'Connell. My wife and I, Denise, live at 106 Hollister. Um, I like the I like the effort put in by the. Um, designer. However, uh, we do have some major concerns regarding privacy. Um, and I'd like to point out that there are four windows on that side of the house. So that is not correct information. Um, as far as the trees go, and I wasn't I, really... I'm sorry, I got a question. So four windows where they were on... Saying there, were no, there were no windows on that on side your of the house. On your, house. On, on, on your house. There four windows on your house. On your house, there's four windows? Okay. Right. Um, as for, I wasn't really planning on focusing on the trees so much, but as a former arborist, I really love trees. And I think that um, it's safe to assume that they'll keep growing after they take out that middle one. It's not going to stop. So uh, I'm not sure that that precedent of taking out the middle one will then end up resulting in taking out the other two when those roots start impacting the new structure. Um, so anyway, the hardship that that tree was there when they bought the property about a year ago. It's not a new hardship. It was there. It was there when they bought it, as was the cliff, which the 50-year variance, I'd like to suggest that um, it lines up with the Coastal Commission's 100-year setback, um, which uh, I'm not sure why the trees and the, co and the coast are, an, are not an issue. They seem to be issues, but the 50-year setback is where it's at now. However, we're going to contest that as well. Um, the building height, I can understand because of the roots, but we're going to, we'd like to contest that variance as well. The seven and a half foot variance on the um, side of the house for the second story is also something we'd like to contest. And I'm not sure if there are any issues regarding an outdoor staircase, um, but I'd like to discuss that or have a, that discussed as well. Um, the house is being proposed as a four-bedroom house with an art room downstairs with the closets. I'm not sure why it's an art room. Um, it could easily, just as easily be a bedroom, and so I'm concerned that that's going to require more parking. Um, what, I'm not sure if there's a definition for an art room or not, but it looks like a bedroom to me. Um, we're really concerned, really concerned about the integrity of the, uh, of the, of the cliff. And, and how the building is going to impact our privacy. It's a, it's a very large structure. Um, that, back, that backyard is, is, is a kind of a haven. It's, it's very peaceful. Um, and we feel that it's going to be somewhat of an imposition. Um, we'd, we'd like to know uh, what the hardship is that ne necessitates demolishing this house and building a, a much larger structure when it, when a smaller one might suffice. I'm not sure what the hardship is, but uh, you know that's something we'd like to discuss as well. And we'd also like to know that when this is demolished, if there's been any um, concern or uh, thought put into asbestos removal as it pertains to that that uh, being regulated. Um, so we're, we'd like to, you know, we we are going to contest those issues um, and. Uh, this was we, we basically haven't seen any of these plans up until about a week ago when it was posted on the commission site. So this was all new to us. Um, 
I'd like to position on that sign, uh, the sign ordinances that, you know, ordinances are made. Sir, if you want to talk about this project, that's fine. We don't yeah. need to go into other things. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I think that, I think that pretty much covers it there. Um, I just want to make it clear about the four windows or our windows on that side of the house. So we're, we are concerned about privacy on thank that you. side. So. Thank you. Okay, is there anybody else that would like to speak? Okay, we have someone in the back there. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous. I'm not usually on this side okay. of the podium. Um, my name is Sarah DeLeon. I actually am the tenant at 105 Sacramento Avenue. Um, I'm hoping to say that I'll be a community member for two years on um, this February. Um, I say that because after this last couple of years, land ownership has changed, obviously, with the Holdners. Um, and for about the last few months with the new landlord, I've been told how wonderful of a tenant I am. Um, and we've been discussing an ADU that she had planned as part of this renovation. And I was really excited about it just because it made me feel, one, excited to be able to stay and that she was including me as part of something that's so important to her family. It made me feel like I was part of the family rather than just a tenant. Um, so it was really nice to be thought of and included. And then you can imagine my surprise in reading the staff report and there's just a one-liner and a couple words that the ADU has been removed. Um, more surprised too, just based on state legislation that's coming down regarding ADUs and the importance of um, ADUs and rentals for you know, adequate housing for Californians. Um, and then reading your housing element, just that rental stock is also important to you guys and the availability of adequate housing, not just for families, but for individuals. Um, I respect and understand the position of staff in looking at all the codes and regulations and needing to follow that. Um, I'm really hoping that there is the opportunity here for rediscussion and looking at that plan that had the ADU in it. It was above the garage uh, originally. I don't know what the exact issue was for that. If it's parking, I'll move my car. If it's public works and trash can't get in, I'll work it out and move my car on that day. Um, but otherwise, I'm just hoping that maybe you guys can be early adopters for the legislation that's coming and put an ADU on this property. Thank, thank you. Okay, anybody else would like to speak? Okay, seeing none, then I'll close the uh, public. Oh, was there someone here? Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Denise Ryan, and I've lived at 106 Hollister Avenue for almost 30 years. And I've seen a great deal of um, a lot of changes going on on that cliff. Um, uh, we have worked very hard at protecting that environment. It's a blessing that we live there. Uh, the blessing of living there comes with responsibility, a great deal of responsibility in protecting what is an already very precarious um, property and I believe it's possible to build a structure that is livable but does not impact certainly our privacy so greatly but also the environment I'm very worried about the cliff and the erosion and that's it thank you okay thank you Hello. Hi, I'm Lori Munoz, and I live on Escalona Drive, so the building doesn't impact me, but I do walk over there a lot. And I think it's really commendable that they took a lot of thought and effort to try to save the trees, because I looked at purchasing that property as well, and the trees were something that I said when I looked at it, all that would have to go. I didn't have any kind of vision to foresee how you could put a, a new structure in there. Clearly the structure that's there is damaged by the trees that are growing. And so to, you know, that's going to take a lot of time, a lot of effort. What they're talking about with the root mapping, the cost associated with that's going to be significant. I mean, so you can tell they put a lot of thought and time 
and consideration into how they could save the trees and try to live with the trees, which I think is amazing that they did that. So I support the variants, and I'd just like to say that. Thank you. Okay, is there anybody else that would like to comment on this tonight? Okay, if not, then I'll close the public comment period and bring it back to the commission. I'm going to start with an easy part is the uh, parking. Maybe not okay. so easy. I, I'm fine with the driveway and the garage. So I have a question first, maybe. Because the plans say three spaces are required, and the staff report says four spaces are required. The staff report's accurate. Okay. So it's three uncovered and one covered. And if we do we have any, do we address in any way the concept of three tandem parking spaces? I, I don't believe so. It's the first time that I can recall seeing that, but God, I mean, that's what we have here, I guess. So involved moving a lot of vehicles. Okay. Other than that, I, don't, I mean, I think that's the easy variance one. Uh, yeah, I think, I think that's the easy variance. The height and the side yard setback variances are pretty difficult for me. Um, I understand they're on the block and they have the large front setback, but it seems like you're building a completely new house uh, that, um, you know, you could figure out a way for that house to conform to to the zoning regulations. And even if there was, you know, a problem on the rear of the house because of the trees that you would, because you uh, mentioned that the house was going to step down, well, don't apply for a variance for the whole thing, you know, sort of redesign it so you don't need that much of a variance. So I, d I have difficulty with the side yard variances and the height variance on a, on a new structure. Mm -hmm. yeah, I can agree with that. The problem really is the um, <coughs> bluff setback that means that there isn't as much of the uh, lot left to be used for the building than there would otherwise. So they're trying to get a lot of square footage into what's left. Right, mm -hmm. but there still is some space there that uh -huh. might yeah, see, I find this interesting because um, we just approved a variance because of an existing house that had the setback issues with the sides. And uh, so this one, it does have side, the first yard, the first story does meet the side yard setbacks. The neighboring property of uh, off of uh, Hollister there, 106, they're about a foot off the property line, to, well, one to two feet off the fence line right there. Um, so, you know, as time changes, it's kind of interesting how our, our codes change. But in this, I, I, what I want to say is I commend them for the, the – uh, obviously the tree roots are the big thing. I've talked to a couple of people who uh, called and asked about the trees and they were looking at the property for uh, uh, the Holdners. And, and I'm going to tell everybody that uh, the Holdners are family friends. But putting that aside, um, when it comes to variances like this, the height variance, I think, is to me is something that it doesn't affect anybody, n neither the side properties nor the one behind them, and uh, clearly it's it's there to protect the tree. So that one I really don't have an issue with. Uh, trying to tell design how to design a house um, to say we can just uh, well you can go back and redesign it. I think probably Derek, if anybody could do it, would probably have tried to. Uh, meet that, knowing that the staff recommendation was um, not in favor of that. But I think uh, when you look at what they've done, the field of view for the neighbors that were speaking here tonight, to allow them to um, have that field of vision because clearly they could have moved their house further out another 15 feet in, in that area, but was respective to, uh, to their view and tried to be respectful of that view. Um, I know the ones, uh, there are some on that same side there. I'm not aware of the, the, the windows. I just saw the roof with the skylights on the neighboring property. The neighboring <coughs> property to the uh, east there with the hedge um, is not really an issue because um, they have a, a bathroom wall, but that hedge pretty much and the trees take care of uh, 
shielding anything along there. So um, I don't have an issue with the height. I think this is a special circumstance. You're kind of stuck in a box. You can't really move it forward. Obviously, if they, they cut the tree down, but if you uh, are in the Depot Hill area, that tree is a significant tree. You can see it from my house in Escalona. You can see it from just about everywhere. They're a beautiful set of trees there. And uh, I know the owner that sold the property, one of the conditions was obviously they want to try to find someone that could keep those trees that, that live there um, to stay. So uh, for me, I don't have a real issue with that. I can see the variance. I don't think this variance is based on the lot with the 50-foot uh, the setback. And the flag lot, I think it kind of does constrain their ability to have. And when you're buying a, a oceanfront lot, you obviously want to be able to build a house that's going to um, be of value on that property and not underbuild at the same time. So um, those are my comments. Uh, I'm more... Uh favorably inclined toward the height variance than the side yard. I mean, I can really see the special circumstance to the height, uh, although it, on the other side it's been pointed out that the uh, ceiling height is 10 and a half feet, so, uh, you know, there is a mit there's a way to mitigate, but uh, I didn't hear any neighbors saying that the height uh, was really a, a, a major concern. I'm not seeing the justification for the side yard setbacks yet. Okay, I'll crack that thing. <laughs> um, I'll propose uh, making a motion approving this application with the variance for the landscaping on the parking and the location on the garage um, and for the height of the building but not the side yard setback. So we have a motion? I'll second that. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. That concludes our public hearing uh, portion of the meeting. So we'll bring it back to uh, the director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A few items for you this evening. Uh, first, the SoCal Creek Water District is going to be holding a notice of preparation meeting, which kicks off their environmental impact report process for their groundwater replenishment project. That meeting is going to be held December 7th at 2 p.m. and then again at 6 p.m. So two meetings, 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. December 7th uh, at Twin Lakes Church Building 2700. And I'll remind folks of that in December as well. I also believe they're going to probably come either in December or January to give a presentation to the Planning Commission, which will follow up on a presentation given next week to the City Council. Uh, in addition, uh, next week we will be presenting a couple items to City Council. Um, new building and fire codes are going to be going into effect. No significant changes uh, that affect Capitola, but we're going to be updating those codes. Um, we're also going to be presenting a consultant contract to update our Americans with Disability Access Transition Plan. And then finally, I'm sure you're aware, but City Council did consider uh, parklets last week, approved it on a four-to-one vote uh, for a two-year trial program limited to San Jose Avenue, um, occupying no more than four spaces and a maximum of two parklets. And Commissioner Westman did represent the commission and uh, did share your concerns very eloquently. And then finally, if I may indulge you, um, we have been trying to update the content on our city website to be a little bit more user-friendly and provide information to our applicants. I just wanted to briefly oh, great. show you some of the stuff that we've added. So on our main page for the community development home, we've added a new tab, which is at the bottom here, called Permit Information and Guidance. And if you bring that site up. Uh, we prepared a number of permit information bulletins. Um, so if an applicant has uh, questions about, you know, how do they process, uh, let's see, your uh, conditional use permit, then you click here. We've written up a little bullet and kind of given me overview of the conditional use permit, what they can expect in terms of time and cost and processing, the hearing requirements, findings, and that sort of thing. 
Uh, we've prepared, I don't know, about a dozen of those. We're going to continue to add some uh, as time allows. I can imagine some kind of topical bulletins would be handy for historical uh, resources and, and things of that nature. We've also done some other guidance and information regarding, um, you know, the permit processing in Capitola. Uh, I recall Commissioner Walsh wanted to see us prepare a permit flow chart, so we've done that and put it up on the website. And then finally, we've added uh, another list of our common applications on this site in addition to the applications tab, um, and then some other state guidance, uh, some information on time and cost, things of that nature. So I'd encourage you to look at it at your leisure, and if you have other ideas, see problems with any of it, uh, I would love to hear that, and we'll continue to try to make some improvements. Nice. I may have another idea right now. It depends. <laughs> the, flow, it. the flow chart that you showed that you did? Now, if you click on uh, the button like the CEQA, will that bring up the CEQA requirements? In? It doesn't. Um, I can look to see if I can do that. I, I did put – Ryan uh, can do it, I know. It's, I did put in hyperlinks. It's, it's called a hyperlink. It's another hyperlink. Into the uh, permit guidance, so like, you know, fee schedule, I hyperlink that so you can click it and it will bring you up to the fee schedule nice. if you want to see what those fees are. Um, I some like code it. Code references, things of that right. nature. Yeah. Yeah. Thank right. you. Good job. Could you put something in about when they contact the planning commissioners to use their discretion? I, I will do that. How, much, how many times and they contact us? And that concludes my, my report for the evening. Any Thank commissioner you. comments? Yes, I do. Okay. Okay, so um, for the last 50 years, uh, 50. the uh, Capitola has been, uh, for want of a better description, chasing its tail with regard to parking. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, my uh, councilman already knows what's coming here, but so I, I'm happy to report that there finally is light uh, at the yeah. end of the tunnel. Oh, really? There is a solution to the Capitola's parking problem, and it is the autonomous vehicle. Just send it away. Yeah, and um, as you start to research more into this, you'll see, I mean, nobody knows exactly how this is going to shake out. But uh, in all probability, it's going to drastically reduce or eliminate parking lots and the need for parking lots. Mm -hmm. So before we spend nine million, we should, you know, think ahead maybe. It's twenty million, by the way. Twenty million, whatever, in doing something that maybe got the uh, horse and buggy. <laughs> Two years later, um, this I, um, it sounds facetious, but it's not really facetious when you've got. The brains from um, Google, Amazon, uh, Tesla, and Uber all putting all their energies into this uh, as the, the uh, wave of the future. And then you attach to that the fact that it's in all probability going to eliminate or reduce drastically the need for parking lots. It, it really may be the, the uh, answer ultimately. I think it's definitely so a just, future. If your car takes you to the village and then you just tell it to it go goes home. home. <laughs> go, 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 drive around, go home. I, you know, no one knows exactly how it's going to work yet. <laughs> but it can't, those cars can't drive around without a person in the car, can they? Yeah. Yeah, they, they can. They That's what they're doing. They're going to be. Okay. Go through mountains. So, right I mean, I, mean, I, I seriously, this is this is a, we we aren't going to find a, another solution that's really a great solution. We might limp along for another 50 years, but yeah. this is the great solution. So do nothing. Well, I want that solution to come before I get sold. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so the solution is do nothing. Uh, hope. Hope. <laughs> we can sit, we can keep doing what we've done for 50 years, but you know. Okay, I guess if. Anybody else? Then well, I guess I we need a motion, we to, mo motion to adjourn. <laughs> How about a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. And a second. Thank you, Ed. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Right. Thank you. Good job. Good night. Glad you waited till the end. Yeah. <laughs>